their kids' names on them because they're signing in on their laptops. Uh, Since you're broadcasting it or streaming, you might just want to mention that, like, oh, change your name. Great. Yes. Great point. (laughs) Thank you. Of course. Um, Hi, everyone. I think we're having folks starting to sign in. Uh, My name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am the assembly member for the 34th Assembly District. Welcome. Um, I want to note that, um, I'll repeat this again, but um, we will be recording this uh, panel tonight and um, it will be streaming live on uh, Queens Public Television. Um, So one of our speakers made an important note to make sure that whatever name is on your screen is when you feel comfortable um, being broadcasted. Um, I'll probably just broadcast the speakers, but certainly if you have a question, your name might pop up. So please be mindful of that. If it's your, you're signing in on your children's name, um, just be thoughtful of that as well. Um, again, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am the assembly member for the 34th Assembly District. I cover um, the communities of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside. I'm so honored to have a host tonight, a virtual town hall series on mental health at the beginning of Mental Health Awareness Month. So thank you so much for joining. Um, As we start uh, logging in, if folks can uh, start uh, typing in the chat, you know, your name, uh, your pronoun, uh, any visual description you want to share, um, perhaps what neighborhood you're from. Uh, so, uh, and if you have questions as we go through the panel to be, you're welcome to, to share that in the chat. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I have uh, brown hair and a very sparkly shirt because I'm going to a event later outdoors. I'm really excited to have you all today as we kick off Uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, and we have such a great uh, group of speakers, and we will have a surprise guest uh, in a few minutes as well. Um, So if we could start chatting, um, please share your name, uh, your pronoun, uh, what neighborhood you're from, and uh, any anything else you want to share um, in the in the in the chat. So we'll give it just another minute or two as folks are signing on. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, June, for kicking off the chat. I'll model and I'll put my name. So my name is Assemblywoman Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I use she, her, ella pronouns. And I have lived in Jackson Heights for 20 years, <laughs> or maybe more. I lived in Woodside for a year before that. Um, so we're really excited um, that you are joining us tonight. And we'll just give it another minute or so before we get started. Greetings, folks. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start providing some logistics in a moment. Um, Again, I want to welcome folks who are getting signed in. Um, Today is uh, hosting a virtual town hall series uh, on mental health for Mental Health Awareness Month, which uh, just started in May. Um, We're so thrilled to have three wonderful speakers joining us today. Uh, We have uh, June uh, Matsu, uh, Matsuyoshi um, from Apicha Health Center. Uh, we have Alpana Chowdhury uh, from Wolf Therapy, who's a constituent of my district. And we have Jessica Verera Morales from the Woodside Clinic of the Child Center of New York, also in my district. So we're so thrilled to have such wonderful folks um, to share um, guidance, advice, Um, food for thought as we enter Mental Health Awareness Month. And as we all know, it's been a very difficult period in our community, um, in our city, in our state, in our country. 
And um, we are thrilled to have such wonderful guests share the resources that we need to stay healthy um, and balanced throughout this time period. Um, we will also have a special guest in a few minutes. Um, Senator Chuck Schumer will be joining us to say some greetings. Um, so we are thrilled to have him uh, join us as well. Um, so I'll start off with some logistics. Again, welcome. Um, everyone will be muted to start. Um, again, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, assembly member for the 34th district. I have brown hair, um, light eyes. I have a sparkly shirt because I am celebrating uh, something later on tonight. Um, and as you enter, please um, share anything you want in the chat, your name, your pronoun, um, perhaps what community you are from. I've lived in Jackson Heights for 20 years. Um, and again, as we start Mental Health Awareness Month, um, I'm super excited to have um, this panel discussion on something that's so critical. Um, mental health and well-being has um, been such a priority for me in my life um, as an advocate and as someone who has done a social justice work. Um, you cannot be on the front lines of movement work without taking care of yourself. And we have such wonderful speakers joining us to share their um, experiences, thoughts, guidance, uh, advice in ensuring that um, we take care of ourselves and our families in this moment. Um, so I am going to see if we have Senator Schumer on yet. Don't think he's on yet. Um, but let me do a quick introduction of our speakers. Um, Melina, can you go to the next slide? Um, we will have the Senator join us in a few minutes. Um, Jun Matsuyoshi um, is joining us from Apicha. Um, they're the Director of Mental Health Services at Apicha Community Health Centers. Um, Jun's professional interests include psychotherapy of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer populations and cultural influences. Um, she comes from an immigrant family and is an advocate for immigrants. And um, June, I'm so thrilled you are with us today. Thank you so much for being here um, and sharing your um, guidance, expertise, and, and recommendations for our community. Um, next slide, please. Alpana Chari, we are so happy to have you. Alpana is a constituent of mine, so I'm thrilled to have her. Um, and she's joined us um, you know, many months ago in doing a similar uh, workshop where we were entering COVID and we wanted to provide some resources and tools and, and um, you know, guidance to getting through this very difficult time. So it's a little bit full circle to come have Alpana join us again as we start into a different phase during this pandemic. So Alpana is at Wolf Therapy. She founded Wolf Therapy in 2018 as a response to the constant request for counseling that takes intersectionality and systems into account, right? We know that we are beings that have uh, multiple identities and we are interacting under multiple different conditions. And that's really important to, to center as we do um, mental health and wellness work. So I'm so grateful for her perspective. She has a background in applied psychology, uh, psychology and research and has presented at the Association for Psychological Sciences and managed project funded through the New York uh, US Department of Education and National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. So thank you, Alpha, for joining us. Um, so grateful to have you again. And then our um, uh, our next speaker is also Jessica Barrera Morales, um, who's at the Child Center of New York. I'm really excited to have Jessica with us because the Child Center of New York um, is based in Woodside in, in my district. So I'm thrilled um, to have a local resource here as well. Um, Jessica is the Senior Program Director of the Woodside Clinic of the Child Center of New York and is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of New York. Um, and she's been with the Child Center of New York uh, for 15 years. Wow. <laughs> um, and you focus on mental health services for children and families um, in Woodside and its surrounding communities. So right here in the 34th district. Um, Jessica has over 20 years of experience working in outpatient and inpatient behavioral health clinics. Um, so thank you, Jessica, for joining us. And we're going to check to see if the senator has joined us. Senator Schumer, are you with us yet? I can only see a couple screens, so I cannot tell. 
And again, as uh, you all join us, please type in your name, your pronouns, and um, what neighborhood you live in. Okay, so the Senator has not yet joined us. So I think I want to get started. Um, and then um, we'll have to sort of pause when he joins us. Um, as he says, welcome your remarks and we'll um, have him uh, have, get back to the program. Um, but let's start off with um, Alpa. Alpa, you, you know, as, as I mentioned, you did a workshop with us, a virtual workshop um, back in, I think it was last March or April, as we began to sort of grapple with the realities of this pandemic. And I, back then we actually didn't know how, how grave it would be and how, how it would radically change the way we live and work and raise families and go to school and, you know, operate in society. And now we're at this interesting stage where we're beginning to see a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel. And while I think there's, you know, we don't want to go back to normal, right? Normal was not okay oftentimes, but I think it's an opportunity to sort of re-envision what our life will look like moving forward. You know, I am thinking a lot about how we sort of mentally transition back out of, you know, living in quarantine or having to be an essential worker and navigate a um, environment where you have to sort of care and operate yourself in, in, in certain ways, right? Masking and social distance. And now as we begin to be, become vaccinated and perhaps be able to like hug one another again <laughs> um, and interact in ways that are uh, we haven't been able to do so in so long, I'd love to get your thoughts on how to begin to, to really um, mentally transition um, in a way that's like healthy um, as we begin that new phase of of where we are in COVID. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, I mean, it's such a, it is really kind of eerie to be speaking to approximately one year later um, and, and really a neat way to, to track some of the time and, and things that have been going on to acknowledge uh, the passage of that time has been really meaningful for lots of folks. Um, anniversaries tend to do that sort of thing. They remind us that time has passed. Um, and you're absolutely right. Oh, I have to actually, I have to pause you before you start sharing your wisdom because we just got the senator on. So. <laughs> awesome. So I'm sorry to pause you. We just, but we 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 didn't get yet into the meat of it. So, um, Senator Schumer, I see you're here with us. Hello. Hello. Okay, um, Melina, if you can go to his slide, I want to do a quick introduction of you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you as we kick off. Um, Mental Health Awareness Month, which is in May. Um, Senator Schumer, as I don't, I think you like need no introduction. <laughs> um, but we have the senior senator of, uh, of New York, and um, and is now the Senate Majority Leader in um, the United States. And we're so honored to have Brooklyn's own <laughs> uh, Senator Schumer, uh, Schumer join us. And one fun fact I wanted to share is that Senator Schumer started his political career in the state assembly and you were elected at 24, correct? 23. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, so, beat, uh, I beat your Queens colleague, Khalil Andrew. I know Khalil, yes. <laughs> so we're thrilled to have you and I'd love for you to make just some welcoming remarks right. um, just before we kick off this program. So thank, thank you for you. joining well, us. I, I don't want to take too much of the time from the program, but first let me tell everyone on this Zoom that you are so lucky to have Jessica Gonzalez Rojas as your assembly member. She is dynamic, she is smart. She has a heart of gold. Uh, we've gotten to know each other and I see how much she cares about her constituents and I see how effective she is in so many different ways. You know, the new young folks coming into the assembly and the state senate and the city council are a great breath of fresh air in helping <laughs> people who need help with new strength and vigor. So let me say to you, Jessica, you're doing a great job and we're all proud of you. So um, let me just say this, um, and I appreciate being invited to speak at the Mental Health Town Hall. It's been a specially difficult year last year, but especially those suffering with mental health issues. We face the worst public health crisis and an economic crisis in a generation. And when you consider all of this came in the last year of an administration, which it directly threatened undocumented people, communities of color, those in our society have the, who have the least, it's no, it's no 
uh, surprised that so many are struggling now. For too long, mental health support has been a neglected focus of government. And COVID showed us, COVID did so, you know, I like to say that Martin Luther King lifted a giant, hoisted a giant mirror on his shoulders. And then with his eloquence, his brilliance, and with his faith, he forced America to look into the mirror and they didn't like what they saw. And we began the slow, long path to civil rights and equality that we're still trotting on. The same thing with COVID. COVID showed us all the weaknesses in our society. And one of the biggest weaknesses was the lack of mental health services for so, so many people. And um, so I did, I worked very, very hard and we secured over $8.3 billion in, uh, um, to, in uh, money to combat mental health and substance abuse disorders, 3.8 billion in the American Rescue Plan, 8.3 billion total. And our mental health service providers will be able to apply to SAMHSA for this. So one of the reasons I wanted to get on the call is to tell all of you to let all of your uh, fellow providers uh, know that there is money coming down the pike, real money, most money that the federal government has done, I think, in forever, and you can apply for it. And I'm sure Jessica's office will work with my office to help you apply. It's so disheartening, so disheartening when you read about I met a man in Buffalo. He was a big construction worker. He had all kinds of tattoos on his muscular arms. And he told me this story. His son um, was in, in Iraq, came back, had PTSD. He had PTSD, and then he became an opioid uh, uh, abuser. You know, you all know how it is. You can't get your child or your friend to go into treatment until they hit bottom. Finally, his son hit bottom. And they brought him to, they went to the treatment centers around Buffalo. They said 23 week wait. His son killed himself the 22nd week. This story can be repeated over and over and over again. Our shortage of funding for treatment, for mental health treatment to deal with substance abuse, which goes hand in hand sometimes, um, is vital. There's money on the way. Please pay attention to my website, I'm sure Jessica will put this on her website because she cares so much about this. And we will help you in any way get those dollars from off the shelves in Washington, which we've already appropriated into your hands where I know you will do so much good. So with that, Jessica, I didn't want to take up too much of the program. You're the greatest. I can't wait till we have another lunch at one of your favorite restaurants in either Elmhurst or Jackson Heights or whatever. And keep up the great work. And thank you. And thank you for your fight because we need those resources desperately. And I'm so grateful that you are our leader. And I really appreciate you. Thank you for joining thank you very us. very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Wonderful. So, um, Alba, back to you. We were just getting started to learn about just again, sort of that transition period. And now it's great to know that we'll be having, we'll be receiving resources too for communities that have historically not had access to mental health services thanks to the senator's advocacy. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you were asking um, uh, a little bit about this new phase of the pandemic. One year later, we've all been through so much. Um, and it's true, you know, we keep hearing and seeing the headlines. Um, it's getting better. The city is reopening. The state is reopening. And yet, I, I think there's a, a little bit of a, a mental hurdle that we're all experiencing because, you know, we're hearing things logically, yet we're feeling something else. Um, the pandemic isn't over, it's just entering a new phase. And so that means that we're entering a new period of adjustment. It takes a lot of energy. I mean, it took so much energy to, to enter into the, the period of extreme lockdown to begin with and to cope with that isolation and adjust to that. Now we're being asked to change again. Um, and so that's gonna throw uh, all the systems um, in, into a state of flux. Um, and, and we need to be really mindful and gentle with ourselves during this period. Um, I, I'm telling a lot of folks essentially to, to go easy on themselves and to, you know, it will get better, but for now, ease up the pressure um, despite some of the messages we're receiving, some important messages and guidance that we're getting medically 
but just a reminder that the emotional toll of COVID um, and, and everything that's followed in the past year, I think we're still going to see the biggest impact of in the months and possibly years to come. Absolutely. I think I think it's so true in thinking about how um, our children have endured such radical change. And I and I hope my hope is that, you know, they'll catch up academically, they'll, you know, learn what they what the gaps are. But if they have to come out of this hopefully continuing to be healthy. Um, and with that, I wanted to um, transition to, to Jessica. You know, you work with children, um, the Child Center of New York, and um, you, we were just chatting before we got started that, you know, the need for mental health services for children has, has increased exponentially. Um, can you share, you know, sort of what you're seeing? And then also those of us who are here today who might be parents, what are some things we should think about as we are entering this new phase, and I think Alpha's so correct, right? It's we're not out of this pandemic, um, but we are sort of begin phasing in uh, in-person learning, and I imagine by September we'll see probably more um, universal in-person learning. Uh, we'll see if there's options for remote. We're not sure yet, but um, if you could share any tips or tools that parents need to think about as we transition into this phase, yes. So one of the things that you know we've experienced in the past year is uh, that children have been falling behind academically. They're not really uh, learning or getting all the services that they normally get in school uh, when they're in person. So we're seeing uh, kids really lose their motivation uh, to to do well in school. And we're kind of concerned about what that's going to look like in September when they do go back to in-person uh, learning. Uh, so that and so we suggest that really um, families reach out to the school, whoever is able to help them within the school, whether it be guidance counselors, school-based mental health services that are uh, there to help transition the children into the, that and to be you know, mindful that your child might have some uh, trouble adjusting to that uh, reopening uh, when they've been home uh, comfortably in their safe space, uh, but also uh, lacking the social interaction that is really important for social development in a child. Uh, so, you know, what some of the things that we're seeing uh, with these uh, you know, growing need in mental health services is a bereavement, right? Loss of parents, loss of spouses, other friends, relatives, neighbors, uh, in addition to growing anxiety, you know, uh, for those who already had anxiety, worse symptoms because they're seeing every, all the things that are going around them, not just with COVID, but with uh, protests and all the political upheaval in the recent months. Uh, so and we're also seeing uh, an increase in domestic violence, substance abuse, uh, as well as physical abuse. So a lot of things that, uh, you know, they were there already, uh, they're just more salient now, and there's an increased need uh, in services. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, June, you work with, um, you work at the intersection of LGBTQ communities, um, as well as immigrant communities. Um, can you talk about some of the mental health needs that have come up in terms of your experience and, and the work that you do at APICHA um, and any sort of resources that you could share with the community in terms of what APICHA provides or, um, you know, again, the resources that are out there for communities in need? Yes, thank you. And thank you for your work with the LGBTQ population. Um, here at, at Aperture Community Health Center, we are a primary care facility. We are a federally qualified health center. We um, have a large population of LGBTQ individuals. Many of them are HIV infected and affected. Um, the kinds of things that we see, uh, we're 
working in primary care. And many people come who are interested in getting things like um, cross-gender hormone therapy. Uh, they are referred to us for mental health assessments. And we hear these stories about how people are trying to become themselves, how they are trying to um, tell their families who they are. And in that process, sometimes things don't go well and people are asked to leave the home, um, especially if families are very conservative and um, the news that the uh, adolescent or the young adult brings to the family is not always welcome. So we work with people who have um, social, uh, social problems such as homelessness, um, coming out to families and friends, uh, sometimes people have to talk about their HIV infections and um, seek help from us in adjusting to these things. Um, we're working with people who have substance abuse issues, who have bereavement issues as a result of family members uh, who have gotten COVID and have died from COVID. We offer bereavement counseling. We work with many immigrants and we try to help them with things like asylum services. And we um, work with organizations that offer services such as Immigration Equality, Make the Road, and other um, organizations in the community. And we like to say that whatever the mental health needs are of the patient in front of us, we like to meet those needs, whether it is under our roof or in the community. So if they need specialized services, we are in touch with organizations in the community. And I'm very happy to uh, make the acquaintance of Jessica Barrera Morales um, because Aperture Community Health Center will be opening a clinic in Jackson Heights uh, in the late summer or fall. And we're very much looking forward to new services for families and children. We'll have dental and medical services and of course, mental health services. That's such wonderful news. Do you know where it will be located in Jackson Heights? Yes, um, I think around, I don't know the exact address, but around 37th Street. Mm -hmm. So maybe 37th yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Yes. 37th yeah. Avenue, likely. It's a yes. kind of main thoroughfare, which is wonderful. Exactly. Thank you. That's very exciting news. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, Alpha, I'm going to go back to you. Um, can you share some ways in which, like, some of the tools, right, that where we could begin to support each other emotionally during these times, right? Like, it, no matter our identity, whether it's a, a, as a parent or as an individual. Um, what, what are some tools that we could start thinking about in this in this transitionary period? Yeah, um, I mean, doing what we're doing right now, where we're sharing our stories and we are uh, sending care and, and uh, a message that we value one another is like a, a completely underrated, under talked about tool. It is a tool because if we're valuing ourselves and we're, we're you know, this is the, the foundation um, for the structure of, of how we help um, our communities, our families, the people we love, you, you know, for you as, as a representative um, for the community that, that you live in, um, you know, we value you, we appreciate you and your work. Um, and, and this is a way to uplift the people who are in charge and who have the power to do that. Um, so that's a big part of, you know, just sharing uh, stories, connecting with one another, expressing that value. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to just mention from a, a really practical point of view, something that is, in my opinion, uh, one of the simplest and most affordable sources of information and support is your own body. So tuning into your own body 
right? So paying attention to things like your pulse, your breath, your posture, your hunger, your sleep needs, all of these little things that, that if you just throughout the day, you're checking in with yourself, even by increasing your awareness, you're actually sending care for yourself. And, and sometimes a little bit of resolution occurs. Um, you know, obviously I'm a big proponent of psychotherapy um, for those of us who are fortunate enough to have things like um, private insurance. Um, I believe Senator Schumer was involved in, in this and along with a few other legislators, but um, a lot of private insurance companies have waived things like co-pays. Uh, so, you know, it's possible that services that would have been inaccessible, um, especially if you were just paycheck to paycheck, are now more affordable. Um, you know, I'm coming from the world of private care, uh, which is, you know, historically inaccessible for a lot of communities and folks. Uh, we do our best to make it afford uh, our to make it affordable for folks. Um, but one thing a lot of people don't know is that a lot there are a lot of clinicians out there in the private world that are willing to do reduced fees or set aside a certain portion of their practice to do free or no cost, uh, low cost services. Um, and it's a great way to, to get care and, and to be seen and heard and to work through some of you know the issues that have been mounting um, that we've all sort of been suppressing in order to survive. I, I do want to follow up on that because I think uh, even when you said the chicken on your body, I immediately did a, you know, like a <laughs> um, what is a good way to like make find, like a reminder of those pauses? Like I, you know, even things like eating, I'm notoriously terrible at like, I forget to eat sometimes and that's, and it's not until um, I actually have a friend who's um, a little person and um, does a tweet every day and it's like disability Twitter. It's, two o'clock, have you eaten yet? And it's like, and literally sometimes I'll catch her tweet and I'll remember to eat. Um, but what are kind of like some practical ways that you can find those reminders to do that mental or physical sort of check? It's such a great tip. What a great use of social media <laughs> <laughs> for, for all the thing, the negative things we can say, especially in this world of, of um, virtual everything, Zoom everything, we have to really put a lot of credit, um, give credit there, that it has been an incredible tool. And um, when you can cultivate a social media um, presence in your life, that's helpful, like in that, in that way, um, that's great. But what you just said about how I mention it, and then it's a reminder, a gentle reminder to check in with yourself, um, which is why connection is so important you know, not just the storytelling, but just checking in with yourself, checking in with others. It's a habit. It's a habit that anyone can adapt to. Um, with enough practice, the idea is for it to become second nature so that you're tuning into, um, you know, to get even more specific, there's a difference for a lot of people between physiological hunger or hunger from the stomach and emotional hunger, right? So, Many of us over the past year have been eating out of boredom or we forget to eat because we're feeling burnt out, overburdened, uh, you name it, or we're experiencing trauma in a certain way, which is a very embodied, you know, it lives in the body type of um, uh, experience. Uh, so the more we can connect to others, connect to our world, um, be connected with, be accessible to others, the more likely we are to, to see ourselves and see what our needs are. And then we can address them because you can't address them if you're not aware of them. That's such a great point. Sometimes my team checks in on me. <laughs> Did you eat yet? It's just like they're stepping out to like grab a slice of pizza or whatever. It's, it's a, a nice sort of um, loving accountability with one another, to, you know, it is, and it, it, it's um, it's clear that that you allow yourself and your needs to be seen by others, which is such a great way of cultivating a system of of checks for yourself. Because mm -hmm. um, because either you're trying to build up from a from a deficit, or you're just trying to maintain your your energy levels, um, emotional and physical. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jessica. We're gonna go back to you. Can you talk about? And again, we were sort of chatting before, um, like some of the cases that you're seeing and the sort of situations that you're encountering as um, you work with um, children in 
in the community. I know you mentioned um, violence in the home has been a, a challenge, domestic violence. Um, but, you know, if you could share sort of what you're seeing and, and how um, you are, you know, working very closely with families um, to provide the tools um, to, to, to be well in this moment. Yeah, so when we first went into, you know, uh, shelter in place, we, we tried to really look at the immediate needs of the families, right? And there was a lot of, uh, you know, food insecurity, there were financial problems, which now has transformed into, you know, mental health issues, right? And um, having chronic stress uh, leads to uh, uh, multiple issues, health and uh, um, emotional. Uh, so the children are seeing uh, what their parents are going through. They're uh, also know they know things are not normal. That something's wrong. Uh, so sometimes there's uh, there's trauma related to that. Uh, there's a lot of you know depression because even if they're just going out into the playground every day after lunch and you know, they're interacting with their peers, throwing the ball around, that was taken away from them. Uh, and, you know, so th they started kind of uh, retreating. So we've seen a lot of depression. And in our adult uh, uh, clients, we've seen uh, an increase in, in depression and also uh, substance abuse. Yeah, we did a, uh, we actually did our last town hall on um, intimate partner violence and, and that's, you know, as people shelter in place, um, you know, everyone's homes look different. If the, some people are housing insecure and um, the stress of the pandemic and economic loss and all that has caused a lot of um, deepening challenges in the household. So thank you for your work on that. Um, and, and June, the same question, tell me what um, sort of coming up during this period with around COVID in terms of um, at least mental health or some of the other health needs that have uh, like sort of um, been heightened in this moment um, as, as you have worked in the community? Well, with the quarantine situation, everyone is behind closed doors. So we don't see a lot of things and uh, things don't come to light uh, as they would normally. So I think there is a uh, a lot more intimate partner violence when people are cooped up together and there's so much uncertainty and anxiety. Uh, and um, having to look after children in the home because they're not going to school, uh, there's a lot more drinking and using other substances to get some relief from depression and anxiety. Um, and we are seeing things like even when people are thought to be um, perhaps in a better situation because they have jobs and they can work from home. Um, we know in New York, people live, a lot of them in shared apartments. So they're cooped up in small rooms all day and that isolation really starts to wear on people. Um, myself, you know, you see me with the headset because this is how I work. A lot of the time when I'm working remotely, I have sessions with people via televisit. So um, people will say, well, I don't have the structure of work. I don't have the camaraderie of coworkers. And I'm really feeling this social isolation. Uh, and this is going to sound like a eat your vegetables kind of thing. But I tell people, we really are social creatures um, in the pandemic and being quarantined and isolated from people. Uh, this has led to people spending so much time alone that they start to listen to their own selves and they don't have the usual uh, getting together with family and friends. And this leads to people getting a little bit more um, 
paranoid in some respects uh, and their cognitive abilities are affected because um, we know scientifically that people who are socially isolated, that part of the brain that deals with emotions, the amygdala, which we really um, need to have social interaction for this development to take place, um, that part of us shrinks. And now we're going back to um, social interaction and we have to kind of build up those social muscles again and reach out and learn how to talk to people and not remain so isolated in our apartments and our homes. Yeah, it's, it's, it is, like you said, if you begin to listen to their the negativity oftentimes that they're, yes. and they don't have that. Well, I know I'm a very social person, so this has been um, a difficult time, although as a candidate and now as an elected, I'm sort of out and about, but um, being very cognizant of being safe and following all procedures, but it's, it's been a still a difficult time. Um, Alpha, I'm going to go back to you. I think, you know, we, we were talking sort of how to, how to care for self and how to check in on self, but what are some signs we should be mindful of, of the loved ones in our life to make sure that they're doing well and, and they're remaining healthy? What are some um, practical uh, things to look for, uh, signs, um, you know, signals, anything that could we can hold as we, again, begin this, this phase of transition? Sure. Um, you know, no one's mental health at this point is, is in stellar shape, right? So with, with that sort of disclaimer, everything, we want to look at everything um, in context and, and with some relativity. But that being said, I, I would say one of the biggest red flags that that people can can really pay attention to is um, really what what both June and Jessica have been saying in in one way or another, which is the reduction or loss of connection, the isolation. We've been living in a state of contraction for a year, and now we're being asked to kind of slowly unfold and take up more space in a way. But even that, with such caution and with being out of practice, um, there are some long-term effects. Uh, you know, so we're all exhausted to a certain extent. But I would say that you know, usually if someone is expressing care, we tend to perk up, right? So we see someone who who's kind of laying low, um, we reach out and you know, if, if there isn't that, that typical response, it could be a sign that someone's entered um, a different level of need. Uh, it, and it's really important to not avoid the topic and to not assume, you know, oh, they're a young person, they're a kid, or everyone turns out okay in the end. Um, one of the worst sayings um, <laughs> that gets repeated often, that, that people will be fine and they'll just be okay, that's not really the case. And when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about largely invisible um, uh, phenomena. So we have to really um, use a different lens when we're looking at folks and we're looking at them as individuals and we're looking at them in context and in systems. And, um, you know, one of the themes of your, of your platform and this community really is that the people who are most vulnerable are usually the most affected. You know, so if you're really... Um, identify in a marginalized way by way of, of race, gender, um, sexual orientation, all of the above, then then it's extra important that we're looking out for, for those folks, um, whether they're in our family, whether they're in our community, um, and to reach out uh, and to be direct about it, to make space um, for whatever their response is. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, can you share um, the, the plethora of resources that your organization provides and maybe as well like some other partners that you work with in the community when there's something uh, you were mentioning that, you know, kind of there's been an increase in need and I'm sure you've had to refer out. Um, so any other resources. And while I ask that question, I invite anyone, if you have questions, to type it in the chat. Um, just a reminder that we are streaming on Queens Public Television. So, you know, uh, just be mindful of that in terms of any questions you may have. And I also want to share the news. Um, Manny Lacayo shared that uh, Apache's 
office in Jackson Heights will be on 37th Avenue and 82nd Street. So that's super wonderful news. It's just outside my district. It's like a block, <laughs> um, but it's still in our community and I'm grateful to have you all um, be here very soon. Um, but just go, yeah, share more about the array of services you provide and what resources are out there, um, even beyond your organization. Yeah, so the, the Child Center's goal is really to strengthen community. So our, we've always had the philosophy of being in the community where there's a need. Uh, so we have services in Jamaica, in Flushing, uh, in Woodside, and then all across Queens in school settings uh, and community centers. Uh, so at the Woodside Clinic, we have uh, primarily behavioral ser health services, individual group family therapy, substance abuse, uh, in addition to early childhood mental health. Uh, we also have satellites in schools like Pan American High School. I'm not sure if that's in your district. Um, and we have a head to a couple of Head Start programs. And one is in Woodside, a few blocks away from the clinic. And they've been doing in-person learning for a while. So it was a great thing that uh, people had the opportunity to really send their very young children to school every day to have that interaction and to kind of prevent, uh, you know, a stunt in their development educationally. Um, because there are so many needs, uh, the increase in in uh, abuse cases, we do have preventive services, uh, which re they really work well with clients who are at risk for ACS cases or uh, they've had ACS in the past. We also have youth development programs and they've been in person this whole time. Uh, they've really been on the ground really working hard in the communities with food pantries and uh, the all the uh, activities that they uh, have always had in the past uh, with some limitations. Uh, we also have home visiting services. Uh, so if uh, people need uh, uh, family therapy in the home or casework in the home, we, we can do that as well. Uh, so I, I hope I'm not missing anything, but we have a lot of different services. And one of the community partners is Elmer's Hospital, who uh, there are a large stream of referrals for us. Uh, and they've been warriors this whole time and helping uh, the community, uh, you know, during COVID when we saw, you know, so many uh, sad stories and, uh, you know, we had to help them with the psychiatric services because there were not enough beds that were being used for COVID patients. Uh, so we are thinking around programming for, you know, uh, children and uh, adolescents who need a higher level of services than what we're actually providing. So we're in the phase of planning that out and hoping to um, apply for some SAMHSA money as well, right? To really improve our services and really meet the needs of the community. Yeah, we're so we're so grateful for that. We're big fans of Elmhurst Hospital here. Again, out of my district, but just like three blocks out of the district. So again, part of the community. Um, and June, if you could share, um, you know, the, you've, you gave it sort of a good array of, of the work that you do, but if you can share the kind of full scope of um, resources. And actually, Jessica, while um, June's speaking, can you share um, in the chat, perhaps like, the website or an information to get connected to the child center. Yeah, June. Okay. So at Aperture, um, we like to address the whole person. And I always say all of us, no matter who we are, every day we're concerned about food, clothing, and shelter. So we have people who are uh, enrolling people in SNAP programs. Um, we have a food and nutrition service, and people can go to classes and learn about nutrition. Um, we have a food pantry. I like to send lists of local pantries to some of the clients in the different neighborhoods. We have the Enroll Manhattan Project that enrolls people in different insurance plans. If they have lost their jobs and no longer have insurance, they may qualify for Medicaid. Um, we have case management services to help people to get linked to HASA, HIV AIDS Services Administration. Um, 
we offer things like uh, prevention of chronic illnesses. So we have screenings for different kinds of cancer. We help people to understand um, diabetes prevention and uh, how to prevent other chronic illnesses like pulmonary and um, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, also, we have bereavement services and we work with places like Calvary Hospital that has various kinds of groups for um, specialized bereavement counseling, such as if you've lost a partner or a sibling, um, they have all of these kinds of services available. So as I said, if you don't have the service under our roof, we will find it for our clients and patients. I love that. We are whole beings, right? We need to be cared for right? holistically. Um, and Juna, I'm going to ask Alpa a question. If you could also just chat um, just the website and any contact information in case folks want to connect with Apache's resources and services. Um, Alpa, we're, we're starting to round out. If you could end with any sort of final thoughts. Um, and if there's like a daily thing, like what is the recommended daily thing? You already provided a bunch of good nuggets, but is there anything else you want to share that we can do daily to, you know, take care of our uh, mental health and well-being? Sure. Um, I, let's see. I mean, Definitely, you know, we were just talking about tuning into your body, but on, that really falls under the umbrella of um, a really buzzy word, which is mindfulness. Um, but, but what that means is that we're just raising our consciousness, we're raising our awareness, asking questions of ourselves, our, our surroundings, our bodies, um, you know, how, what is our sense of time, space, you know, grounding ourselves. Um, Raising your, your general awareness and mindfulness um, through various techniques like meditation, um, you know, picking up the phone and calling someone, going for a walk now that the weather is, is warming up, um, maybe even entertaining plans, um, if not next week, you know, months in advance. There are benefits to doing that, um, to even entertaining fantasies of, of doing this, you know, um, having a, a better circumstance. Um, they do make a difference. Um, and, and, you know, as a reference to what I was saying before about, you know, connection being everything, um, you know, if we're connected, uh, you know, you, you sort of identified yourself as someone who's very social. Even if you don't identify as someone who's a social butterfly, you still have social needs. So if, if you can um, really take stock of where you're at in, in the context of your community, your family, your household, whatever it is, you're going to be much better equipped um, in terms of what you need to do to help yourself um, and to help others. And, and just a quick note that, you know, just because uh, the pandemic stopped so much does not mean that, you know, the daily um, onslaught of, of microaggressions and traumas and, and various forms of oppression have stopped and in some cases have made people feel even more helpless. And so we want to all sort of collectively be mindful of that. And as mental health practitioners, this is so much on our minds and we're seeing this every day. Um, so, you know, mindfulness aside, we really need other people um, uh, to, to be able to see this and, and treat it as it's going on and the anticipation that this is going to continue in some form or another. Um, and we'll really understand the extent of this uh, as time goes on. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. I think the point about just sort of being excited or looking forward to something creates a sense of joy and that's so important. Um, Jessica, how about you, as we close out, is there, you know, kind of a daily tip or tool or resource that you can share as we begin to, uh, as we, as we want to make sure we're taking care of our, ourselves in this time? Yeah, so, and I know that we're all kind of connected to gadgets, uh, but setting a reminder to eat your lunch or to drink your water or to get up away from your desk, right? Away from the computer and exercise and things like that. You can set reminders on your phone for that so you don't forget 
um, that you you need to take care of yourself. Uh, in addition to making sure that you continue the connections that you already have, uh, that just because you're not able to, you know, go to large gatherings, that you could continue to develop the friendships and relationships you have with family members and people in your community. Thank you so much, Jessica. June, how about you? Take it, take it, take us home. What else can you share that uh, would be helpful for us that, um, as you do your important work? Well, I think you know um, when we think of all of the things that we have, uh, it's a short list compared to the things that we don't have. The list that we don't have is very long, and sometimes we start to. Uh, long for, gee, I wish I had this or that or whatever. I wish I were in a better job, whatever it is. And we need to remember that um, the short list may be short, but we do have it and we can hold it in our hand. Whereas the long list is long and we don't have it. And I think of things like, this is very silly, but you know that old saying, bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mm -hmm. So think of what you have, be grateful and appreciate, and you will feel better about yourself and about the people around you. Thank you so much. Such an important reminder. Um, I want to thank you, Alpha, June, Jessica, for joining us, the Senator for joining us. It's so important to have um, these reminders, right, to take care of ourselves. And a lot of it are these small things, right? Gratefulness, mindfulness, um, connection. Um, but it's so wonderful to know that you are each so important in our communities and doing so much important work with our, to take care of one another. So thank you so, so much. Um, our information as an office, we're here to serve you all. Um, our email address, our phone number. Um, we are located in East Elmhurst, um, but we are not um, encouraging in-person meetings yet. Um, but if you wanna make an appointment, we could set something up that's safe. Um, but we certainly have been out in the community. Um, we've done pop-ups <laughs> in the street and um, have been really, uh, made us made ourselves accessible. So thank you so much for having us. Our contact information is there. Um, again, thank you, Alpha, June, and Jessica for all your important work and for joining us tonight. So everyone, I just ask that you care for yourselves, care for your loved ones, check in on one another. Um, our community, this, the, this district is such a vibrant, loving um, community. And, and I think we're very special in that way, but um, it's always helpful to, you know, again, to um, check in on your neighbor. So thank you all so much for having us and thank you all for joining. Um, and we'll keep your eye on the next um, event. And um, oh, one thing I want to add is that we do a weekly newsletter uh, with tons of resources. Mm -hmm. um, it's in English, Spanish, and uh, mostly Bengali. Sometimes our translator doesn't get us back the information on time, but um, we, we definitely are trying to be um, very accessible to the many languages that are spoken in our community. So um, please sign up, uh, send us an email at the email listed there, and um, we'll make sure to add you to the newsletter um, and make sure to, again, get these resources out in multiple languages. So again, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.